Well, hey guys, you're listening to Underground Radio. This is Chad Harold, your normal co-host of Kate Copens for the Radio Pre-Show. And uh, today, Kate's going to be out of town. She's on a business trip. And so I decided I wanted to do something a little different. So uh, I am recording this in our studio, uh, just solo, by the way, which is kind of different. But um, the idea is we've been working through this series in Romans, and it's been really, in my opinion, it's been incredible. We're only one week in And the Lord, uh, let me back up. It was only supposed to be one week, by the way. We were going to do 13 verses, one week, no big deal. We got started, and I kept going back and kept going back and kept going back and realized that there's just so much good meat here. It really is a crime to just blow through it in one week or now even two weeks. So uh, instead of extending this out to a month-long series, uh, what I wanted to do was insert a second message here in between our two. So we spoke last week, that message is available, Uh, we call that a living sacrifice, it's from Romans 12, 1 through 2, and uh, that's available now, you can go listen to that on our app, or you can listen to it online, YouTube, podcast, however you want to do it, it's all there for you for free. And then tonight, uh, I'll be back up, and we're going to be going through Romans 12, and we're going to work through three, through like six and a half-ish, somewhere around there. And so uh, to finish out, though, and to really set us up for next week when we come back and really close it out and do the the verse, by the way, which originally was the whole purpose of doing this little mini-series, which I think is cool. And that just shows you the power, by the way, of God's Word, how much, how crammed in there, crammed into it is so much wisdom, so much guidance, so much uh, really grace. And I just think it's awesome. So uh, this is all leading up. So anyways, you're going to get a little extra message this week. So I don't know when you're listening to it. Uh, and I do want to warn you, there may be some overlap because I'm doing this one first and then going back and doing the message tonight for a couple of verses back. So anyway, it's going to get a little confusing, but it's going to be great. And uh, I'm really excited. So here we go. I just want to talk through this. It'll be a little different than uh, our normal message because I don't have a crowd to interact with. It's just me and a blue wall, which looks really nice, by the way, with this little picture and some things hanging on it. But uh, I noticed that if I tell a joke, no one's going to laugh, so I'll just have to pretend I'm funny. So anyways, again, thank you guys for listening in. I hope you enjoy this. Um, Again, I'm just going to go through, break down some of these verses as we would in any other message and try to walk us through and really get us a better understanding of what is happening here in this portion of Romans and how it applies to us. I want to start with this. When I was um, in high school, I played basketball, and uh, believe it or not, I was actually really good. Uh, I was white and I was short, but I could shoot and I was fast. And so I remember wherever I would go play, whether we were playing at the school or we were playing pickup games at the Y or just at some random park on the street, it didn't matter. Wherever I went, people really enjoyed having me on their team. They knew that I was a clutch player. I was important. And uh, and then I got injured through a couple of different scenarios. And as I've gotten older, just a little bit because I'm still really young, but as I've gotten older, I realize now that uh, as I go out and try to play basketball, uh, I am the last one that's picked. And, and that's not to be funny. That's the truth. Uh, people will pick me last, and if they didn't have to pick me, they wouldn't. So since then, I've decided to step away from the game of basketball for the better. But the point is, I am trying now, when I play basketball, to try to do something that at one point in my life I was extremely good at, and yet now things have changed. And that kind of sets us up for what these verses are going to be about. And the point I really feel like Paul was trying to get at as he enters into this portion of Scripture, is to not try to be something that you are not. Don't try to be something that you are not supposed to be. And when we have this desire in our culture, in our world, in this generation, that we want to do everything, and we have this great desire to do that. And I believe in part that's a good thing. But if we're not careful, we can begin to pursue things that we're not supposed to do, and all it does is slow us down and take us off track for what God intends for us to do. And so we're going to hit this passage of Scripture. I was going to talk about spiritual gifts, and we'll get to it a little bit later. We'll talk about more of it tonight uh, at Underground. But the point is, we must understand where God has gifted us so that we can be sure we are pursuing the right thing that He has in store for us. Now, it's important that you rightly evaluate what your spiritual gift is. And this is where most people begin to first question they didn't even realize. Some don't even realize that you have a spiritual gift. And so let me just set the stage for you right now. When Christ was here on earth, he died on the cross, he was put in the tomb, he rose again, and then for about 40 days he walked around the earth 
interacted with the disciples on various locations, including many other people. And at the end of his time here on earth, before he ascended to heaven, he gave out the great commission, go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, basically, I want you to go. I am leaving with you everything, the mission, if you will, that I was doing here. I'm now leaving with you, and I am going back to heaven to be with the Father, and I prepare a place and wait for you you. And what he says is, my mission now becomes your mission. When you became a believer in Jesus Christ, which I pray everyone listening is, when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, that mission of being Christ's hands and feet was in addition passed on to you. And you hear that and you go, wow, when I look at Christ, when I study the things of Christ, when he was on the earth, there's no way in the world I could possibly do all the things that he did. And the reality is that is absolutely true. But before he left, he told us, I am with you always. And what he was saying, what he was hinting at is an enormous statement that truthfully we could spend a whole series on and and we probably will one day. In fact, we will. I'll make that note here. We will do a series one day. But the point is through the Holy Spirit, you and I have been given power to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, a task that is impossible as individuals, yet becomes possible because we literally have God living inside of us. And so upon Christ ascending into heaven, he said, oh, I'm leaving all of this with you and I'm empowering you so that you can go. So how do you find out what the spiritual gifts, and by the way, we're going to talk about this tonight, in, in, in essence, you've already heard this, the gifts that we have are spread out. And each gift, each person has a different gift inside the body of Christ. And inside those giftings, they all come together to create the body of Christ. So we use this illustration. If you were to take away your toe, you could still walk, you could still move, you could still turn, but when you walked, it's altered. When you walk, you would fade right or you would fade left. When you walk, you would have a difficult time. Even if it was the pinky toe that you took away, that small piece still has such an intricate part. Does it hinder you from going forward? No, and that's why we can say boldly that the body of Christ can move forward even when everyone is not using their spiritual gifts, but the body of Christ is hindered when not everyone is using their spiritual gifts. And so, i.e., therefore, you better listen and understand that you are an intricate part of the body of Christ, and we need you. The church needs you. Your people need you. Now, will your task be filled by someone else if you decide not to do it? Most likely. And that's on you, because the truth is the blessings that come with that serving are incredible. But the reality is it's up to you. But we are made, we are the body of Christ, each one of us individually. So everyone has a spiritual gift. Now that being said, comes this really big question. How do I know? How do I evaluate? How do I know I have, I am seeking after the right gift? How do I know what my gifting is? And so I just want to give you three things you can think about. The first one is be a living sacrifice. And that's what we just talked about last week. And that is, listen, God wants you to have a relationship with him that's unhindered. A living sacrifice means there is absolutely nothing that gets in the way between you and Jesus Christ. If you will do that, as you are living out this life, being a living sacrifice, God will begin to show you what he wants to do with your life, i.e., you will discover what your spiritual gifting is. Why? Because what God wants to do with your life is the thing that he's gifted you to do. And so when you become a living sacrifice, when you let nothing else in this world get in the way of you and Christ and you live in that way, God will begin to reveal to you. And I can tell you in my own test, in my own life, a testament, that that is true. I did never thought that I would be a teacher of the Bible. In fact, in, in school, in high school and in college, I was one of the worst students. I hated school. I hated to study. I hated all those things. But the reality is, as I began to lay myself down for Christ and to pursue after him over many years, he began to develop me, and then he even brought out the spiritual gift toward me to say, hey, you are actually going to become a teacher of the word of God, as crazy as that sounds. And the beauty of that is I can look back now and go, this is not about me, this is about him. This isn't in my power, because in my power, I didn't want to, I don't even want to study But in his power, he gives me the desire, or we talked about earlier, the faith to want to proceed, the spiritual discernment to be able to deceive and to move 
move forward on that gifting. And so becoming a living, a true living sacrifice to God is part one of helping you to discover your spiritual gifts. The second thing is simply taking a spiritual gifts test. And we've made that available to you guys at Underground here, this past Underground that we just had, and we're going to continue to have those available. But this isn't a, uh, a perfect foolproof way, but a spiritual gifts test really will help you to decipher where you are in your current walk and understand that some of those gifts will develop and some of them may even change. And that's okay over time. And so a spiritual gifts test isn't a foolproof way, but it is a great way for you to be able to ask yourself some questions and really be able to see where do you feel the Lord is gifting you. And one more note, all of us will be able to do all of the spiritual gifts. Okay, all of us are going to be evangelists. All of us are going to be teachers. All of us are going to be preachers, proclaimers of the word. We'll talk about that in a minute. All of us are able to go and to serve and to have mercy, right? We're, we're going to be called to do all of them. However, every one of us will have one or two that seem to just rise to the top. Two that we are just, maybe one that we are just, there's just, you can just tell there's something special about that person when they're serving inside of this gifting. And that's how you know which one the Lord has really called you out to do and where you can best fit the body of Christ. But make no mistake about it, no one is bigger than anyone else, no one is more important, and no gift is more important than another, all right? And so if you feel uh, in your church or in your ministry or your whatever that there is a spot that needs to be filled and you can fill that spot, man, you fill that spot and let through the filling of that spot, the future of what you're going to do develop. When I came into this church, I didn't come in as a teacher, I came in as a volunteer. I came in as someone that was helping, someone that was organizing very quickly. I moved to be a teacher, maybe faster even than I should have, and I'm grateful for that. But the reality is I didn't come in as a teacher, I came in as a volunteer, I came in as a servant, and the Lord was able to develop me. So don't get so stuck on the thought that this is this is what I'm called to do, so it's the only thing I can do. No, we should be well-versed and able to accomplish all the spiritual gifts, and then in that time the Lord's going to really reveal what it looks like. And I think the third thing, so we talked one, living sacrifice, be, be a living sacrifice, live that out too, a spiritual gifts test is a great way. Number three, and that is confirmation from others. Now listen, some people will get the gift of singing. Many people will want the gift of singing. Many people will pursue the gift of singing even when they are not gifted singers. If someone tells you you are not a good singer, it is a very good indication that singing leading worship is not your spiritual gift. Did you get that? Now, we have this tendency to want to pursue things that may get us a little bit more recognition. I want to sing. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a director. I want to lead. I want to be out front. Those are great desires, but if their desire is pushing you in the wrong way, that's a bad thing. And so if, if you think you're a teacher, yet over a few lessons and training and all of that, people still go, hey, that's really not looking like your gift you should probably listen to them because they're most likely right. It's important to have good godly people around you that can confirm and deny the giftings that you're feeling. Because the truth is, sometimes we desire something that's not what God wants. And that's okay. That's natural. I would say we all do that. But it's important to have the right people around us so that we can really discover and figure out what it is that God has in store for us. Why do we have these? We build the body. It's to bless others, and it's to bless you. I want to tell you, as a teacher now, walking in my gifting, still with many, many things to learn, right now I can tell you that the greatest moments in my life are when I'm using my gift, and not just in front of a large crowd, in a small crowd, even here, sitting in a studio talking to a wall, essentially, and hopefully someone's listening. When I'm using my gifting, when I'm using the gift of teaching, I am fulfilled. All right, and so yes, our gifts are to build the body, and yes, our gifts are to bless other people through the building of the body, but at the same time, you will experience blessings you've never imagined experiencing because that is how God works. And so yes, it's a sacrifice. Yes, being a living sacrifice can be difficult, but the blessings that come with it on the other side are incredible, and you really just can't beat it. And I want to say one last thing before we get in. Eventually, we're going to get into some verses here, I promise. But one last thing, when it comes to spiritual gifts, there is this really, and it's, it's a good argument, and that is that are these spiritual gifts, 
are there are all the gifts still relevant? Are there some that are not? Some believe that some of what we call the sign gifts um, are identified as the sign gifts. Uh, ceased when the apostles were done. They were needed because the Bible wasn't around. There wasn't things to line up in accordance to God's word. There wasn't a way to confirm or deny through God. And so that maybe the spiritual gifts were only a certain portion of them, not all of them, but a certain portion of them were only needed while the apostles or the disciples were here on earth. But then once they passed on and once the Bible was written, therefore those were no longer needed because we had the sign, which was the Holy Spirit, and we had the word of God. Now, there's definitely some great arguments to that, and, and I'm not going to totally say that I denied that, but I will tell you that I lean more to the side that all gifts are still relevant, all gifts are still accurate, I think all of them are still used, and I would say that our church believes that as well, um, and, and so I don't believe that they ceased, I believe that they're still going, and uh, and so that being said, I would do like to warn people, though, you should come in and you should study that yourself, you should figure that out for yourself, where you feel like what's beautiful about that is that's what we call a gray area. It's not, it doesn't change the faith, it doesn't change Christ on the cross, it doesn't change who we are as believers in Christ, it just changes a little bit of the strategy. And so whichever way you believe, it's okay. Be careful, though, not to let that be something that divides us because it's not worth it, and that's simply the enemy taking control of something that should be good and using it for bad. And so it's okay to look into this. I'd encourage you, whoever's listening, to study and to figure this out. Find out what you believe, and then whatever you believe, always be open and willing to hear what others think. I'm a young guy, and so I have my opinions and I have my feelings now, but I know that as I get older and as the Lord begins to reveal things in my personal life, he may radically change some of that for me. And I'm okay with that. That's the beauty of being a Christ follower. We, we let him lead us, and then we let the others come around us to support us and to confirm and to deny and to guide us as we're moving forward through some of these and what you would call weighty waters, where it could go either way. And uh, But the beauty of it is it doesn't change who we are in Christ, and that is got to be and always will be the most important thing. So all that being said, there's a, name, a really long intro to where we're getting at, and that is our passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. Let me read this to you, and then I just want to break through it, go through it a little bit, and then we'll close this down, and uh, like I said, hopefully someone out there will listen and be blessed by it. Romans 12, verse 6, it says, In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And again, we said this at the beginning. The main point here, what Paul is trying to do is he is trying to get you to understand if you have a gift, with if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a gift. If you have a gift, go and do it. This is what we are called to do. This is what we need to be doing. If you have a gift, go and do it and be content. Now he opens and he says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts. Now we talked about this earlier, but I'll rehash it again. In his grace, okay? Remember, Becoming a Christian is a gift given to us by God through Jesus Christ on the cross. He died for you and I. That is grace, my friends. Because of God's grace through Christ, because of what Christ did, again, our response to the cross is what? We're a living sacrifice. Two, we're a part of the body. Three, we have a part, a role to play. This is it. Because of his grace, God has given us different gifts. And I think it's amazing because God could have given us all the same gift, but how boring would that be? If all of us were teachers, we would all be in front teaching and no one would be listening. If all of us were, well, if all of us give generously, we would all win, but that's a different story. But the point is, God knew what he was doing, and he separated us, and he made us all equal parts of the body, yet gave us great diversity. In our faith, <clears throat> we're all equal, right? Nothing changes. The, the cross and Jesus Christ dying and then raising again and salvation coming upon us, that faith, that salvation, it doesn't change. It's not more or less for others. It is consistent all the way through. But the diversity comes when we then turn around in response to the cross, that never-changing cross, in response to that, our service is diverse beyond measures. There will be some people that will never stand up in groups larger than three or four, yet they will make just as big of an impact in the world as those that preach to thousands. 
And that is the beauty of Jesus, is that he is always working through even the smallest details, and most people will never, ever know what they did for another until they get to heaven. And let me tell you something, friends. It is not about fame and fortune and being famous here as a Christian. It's not about being a Christian celebrity. Your true reward comes in heaven when God is waiting with the crown or whatever he's got in store for us, and you will be rewarded. That is what you shoot for, and it is the only thing that I believe is healthy for us to shoot for is what we will receive in heaven. So God gives us these gifts, different gifts, all according to his will, all in perfect standing and all a part of a perfect plan. He says, I give you these different gifts for doing certain things well. And he says, well, and that's so important because all of us are going to have different gifts and all of us are going to do different things and all of us are going to be good at some things and not at other things. I may be a good teacher. You may be a good um, person of mercy. Someone else may be a good evangelist. Someone else may be a good uh, prophesier, whatever it is. All these gifts then come together, right? No one is going to be good at every single gift. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of the body. And so remember, again, when you don't serve, you you keep the other believers from the gift that you have that they can't do well. So the body is made perfect and complete when everybody is doing their certain job, their certain task, and when they do those well. So keep going. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Now, prophesy, this is one of those those gifts that can be a little scary at first when you think about it. A lot of times you hear prophecy and some people begin to think, oh, this is like a fortune teller. So you know what's coming, you know what the stock market is going to do, you know who's going to win the ball game tonight, you know if the Rockets are going to make it or not. This is going to be great. Not at all. It's nothing to do with that. Uh, there are some moments in time when God has used people to proclaim, to prophesy of things that are coming in the future that only they could know by God giving it to them. But don't get this confused. This is not some free pass to to, uh, be a fortune teller or to know everything that's going to happen in the world because that's never going to happen. We know there's not just one prophet. There's many people that have the gift, a spiritual gift of prophecy all throughout the world. And the reason for that is because what God is showing to one person is different from another. There may be a prophet inside of our ministry that God is using to say, hey, listen, this ministry, we need to make some turns. We need to, uh, we need to move directions. We need to move people. I need you to go to the leader. I need you to go to Chad. I need you to tell him that it's time for a new direction or we've got to make a change. See, we need people like that, not only in our lives, but in our ministry, because they come, they're listening to the Lord and they speak freely into what we're doing. And so the gift of prophecy is not necessarily knowing everything that's going to happen. It's truly someone that listens to the things of God and then shares them with the people. You can't be a prophet if you never say it. A prophet is one that hears from God and then he goes and he shares it. And again, I go back to the statement that it's not about you only having one gifts. There's been moments when I I have felt what I feel a prophetic moment. Now, I didn't know the future. I didn't know some crazy like that. But I've met someone and said, I really feel like the Lord is telling me I need to tell you, hey, whatever you're doing, maybe that dating relationship you're in, you've got to get out of that. I just see so many things that are not going well, and I want to help you. And so let me guide you. Let me help you, encourage you to get out of that relationship. See, those are moments of prophecy We're not talking about the future. We're not talking about the end times. We're talking about things that are right here in front of me as the guy doing prophecy. Now, I'm not, my spiritual gift is not prophecy in any way, shape, or form, but I've had incredible moments like that when I've been able to share with others what I felt the Lord leading me to do. So the gift of prophecy is super important, um, and it is for a select few, but be careful. This is not a sign gift where you are able to see the future. This is a listening gift of what God is telling you, and then a proclaiming gift of that, almost a preaching gift of that, to go and share that with those that you feel the Lord laying it on your heart. And then he goes on and he says, uh, give the gift of prophecy with as much faith as God has given you. Verse 7, if you gift If your gift is serving others, then serve them well, right? We know the gift of serving, how important it is inside of these ministries to serve, to serve, to serve. All right, some, now listen, don't use this as an excuse. Oh, sorry, I don't have the gift of service, so I can't be a missionary. I can't go on the battlefield. I can't go on a mission trip. That's not for me. Incorrect. All of us are called to do missions. Some, though, will be called to do a lifelong mission. Some will be called to do it periodically. I'm one of those. Go to Bogota. Pretty much every year we go on a mission trip. That's something that I do, but 
a missionary is not who I am. But the gift of service is not limited to just missionaries. The gift of service may be right here inside of our ministry. I can tell you from my wife, she has the gift of service. When people come over, she loves to keep it clean and cook for them and provide for them and ask them what they want to drink. When people come over and I'm there, I'm just like, hey, sit down. You want to drink? There's the fridge. Go grab it. Right? There's a different attitude. There's a different mentality. And that comes from her having the gift of service, just a desire, a burning desire in her heart. And then I can come in and be the the pastoral and, and give that person advice while she's serving and loving on them. And so you begin to see even, even inside the home how God can use these spiritual gifts for his glory. So if you have the gift of service, serve and serve well. If you are a teacher, then teach well, okay? And so there's there's this interesting part because you've got teachers and you've got preachers, and a lot of times we get confused. What do those two mean? And it's really simple. A teacher is someone that takes the time to walk someone through what the Word of God is saying, okay? So that may be in a teaching series where you're going, uh, you know, really deep, really digging into the context, a lot like what we're doing here, digging into the context, kind of taking it word by word, just really wanting to understand what's happening. But then the teacher doesn't stop there. The teacher then walks with those people in their daily life, teaching them how to live out those scriptures. And that's where a lot of people get the teaching preaching confused. A preacher either stands on a stage or it may be one-on-one. It may be a friend to a friend, but a preacher will, what we say, proclaim the word of God will say it, will say, hey, listen, whatever you're doing, you need to stop. Hey, I want to share this with you. I think this is important. Right? Again, you see that that crossover of prophecy and preaching, but the preacher proclaims the word of God, but really just does it one time and then leaves it up to that person to say, either I receive that or I don't. The teacher explains that word of God and then walks with that person and helps them develop, disciples them, begins to teach them and help them understand what the Word of God means and how they can live it out in their lives. So a teacher teaches the Word of God, a preacher proclaims the Word of God and expects that when you hear the Word of God, the Spirit would move you to make a change in your life. And so for me, it just depends on the day. Some days I'm a teacher, some days I'm a preacher, some days I'm right in the middle, and you know what? That's okay because God uses all of us differently. You could line up 10 teachers Hear each one of them teach on the same passage, and regardless, even if they said almost identical words, every teacher is going to teach differently. Some will do it with humor, some will be serious, some will be over the top loud and excited, and that's not bad, that's good, and I, I probably fall in that category more. Others will be very reserved, very quiet, and just present. It doesn't matter. The point is, God uses, even inside of the gifts, people to do those gifts differently. Uh, Many, many years ago, there was a man named Jonathan Edwards, one of the great preachers of all time, and he used to, when he would preach his sermons, he would simply read them word for word without any voice inflection because he was afraid that someone would respond and become a Christian based on emotion and not on simply the truths of the Word of God. And it was even stated that at times while he was reading his sermon, as boring as, as and as plain as he could, people would begin to yell out in the middle of the sermon and ask for mercy from God because they could feel the weight of what he was saying in the truth of what God was doing. Now, that wasn't Jonathan Edwards. That was Jesus Christ moving through Jonathan Edwards. But you know what the difference was? Jonathan Edwards lived a sacrificial life. He was a living sacrifice. And when he preached, there was nothing inserted in the middle. It was the words of God coming through Jonathan Edwards. Now, I will tell you as a teacher, I'm convicted even as I say that. Because the truth is, in the culture we live in today, it's extremely hard to find men of God and women of God that teach the word without inserting anything in between. And so if there's a lesson for any teachers and preachers out there that are listening or that may hear this in some off-skirt conversation, may it be that our focus should be that we teach and proclaim the word of God without anything inserted in between. 
whatever that looks like. That's the key. So teaching and preaching, two different things. But here, Paul, the writer of Romans, is focusing on teaching. And then we'll move through this quickly. Verse 8, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If you encourage, encourage. Nothing better than an encourager to come alongside of you and to build you up. If it is to give, give generously. Do not hold back. God has given you the resources, whether it's of your time, it's of your money, it's of your words. Give and give generously. And then if God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And I want to camp out there for just a minute. There are many leaders inside of our ministry, many leaders inside of the church, and many leaders inside of the body of Christ as a whole all across the world. All those that have been called out to be leaders are set at a higher standard. Let me tell you, you should not desire to be a leader when you think about the reality of what it means. When you become a leader, you are expected by God. More is expected of you. If you are a leader, when you die, you will stand in front of God Almighty, and he is going to have a higher bar set for you compared to the other guy that just decided to choose and follow Christ. How? Ever, when you become a leader, you will experience the blessings and the joy of what come with the ministry of serving and the ministry of leading. And so let me encourage you, though the bar is set high and it should scare us because it keeps us humble and it keeps us focused on what matters. At the same time, we should rejoice because we know as we lead, we will be benefited even more than those we lead. And if you've done ministry any, any any number of years, you know that to be true. Some of the greatest things that have ever happened to me, I thought I was ministering to them, yet the truth is they were ministering right back to me even more. And that's the beauty of how God works. And I noticed that Paul's words change here. He's been saying, if you have the gift of encourage, encourage. If you have the gift of giving, give. But then it says, if you have the gift of leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. It totally changes his vocabulary, and I think it's a beautiful picture as he's writing to the Church of Romans. It's a listen. If this is what you've been called to, this is not just something you do on the side. This is not just something you tackle when it's convenient. If you are a leader in the church, if you are a leader for Christ, you are a leader and you should take it seriously. Doesn't mean you can't have a day job. I love that. I love it when people lead in the church that have jobs out in the world because they are connected to the lost people and they are going to be the ones that get to do great ministry. But let me tell you something. You do not take it lightly. You do not put it second. Christ always comes first. Now, serving in the church doesn't come before your family, so hear that carefully. But if you are going to be a leader, you lead always. Serving and leading, two different things. A leader is someone that you look to and you say, that's the guy or that's the girl that I want to follow. And if you are going to do that, if God has called you to that, you must take it seriously. And then the last little part here, it says, and if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And I think about kindness and encouragement, uh, they truly are the gifts of um, of fulfillment, if you will. When when someone comes in a room, we have many encouragers in our ministry. Uh, in fact, there's one here that works on our staff here at the church with me, uh, and he works in our youth ministry. It's Michael Head. And when Michael is around, I don't know what it is about him, but he just cannot help but encourage you. Whatever it is that you're doing, he just finds a way to let you know, man, that, that, that I heard that message you gave. I, I saw what you guys are doing in your ministry. I saw this, man. It was so great. You guys are doing awesome. I can't believe you come up with this stuff. This is so great. He's just always so encouraging. And, and those guys and, the, and those that, that are kind to you as well, and I think of Stephanie in our ministry right now, just, just kind and just sweet. And you just want to be around those guys because they build you up. And then they kind of just soften the blow that's around you. There's something special about those. And so I want to encourage you, even though those gifts will probably never put you in front of a large group of people, those gifts truly are what help the body of Christ sustain. And so if you have kindness, do it and do it gladly. Again, the whole point of this passage, the whole point of this segment of scripture is that if you have a spiritual gift with, if you are a believer in Christ, you do, then do that gift and do it well. Know that God is giving you the power. It is not you. All you have to do is do it. All you have to do is do it. Stop thinking about what you don't have. Stop thinking about what you can't do. And stop thinking about how you can do it so people can see you. Instead, walk into it humbly and say, I know this is what God's called me to do. I have no idea how I'm going to do it. But I will walk boldly forward because I know that God is walking 
with me. And I pray that he would get the glory in whatever it is that I do. And I know some of you, just to close here, maybe thinking, I am so scared. This thought of, well, I did get the gift of teaching and I am so scared. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Whether it's three people or 300, I have no idea. Would you be reminded that when Christ left, he said, I go, but I am with you always. And what he was saying is my spirit is going to be with you always. And it is my spirit that will give you the strength to do what you need to do. Uh, when I was in Bogota last time, we were in Bogota, Colombia doing um, doing missions. We were doing door-to-door evangelism, just literally walking door-to-door and just sharing the gospel. And uh, we were having a rally the second night we got down there. And we're sitting in the room, a couple hundred people just all kind of gathered. We're meeting different churches. That were, it's all these churches from all over Bogota. And we're about to go out the next morning. We're going to go and just do ministry. It's going to be so great. And all of a sudden, this guy comes in and he says, hey, I have a, a school down the street that are the kids of Christian missionaries, and uh, and they actually speak English, because Spanish is the, the predominant language there. He says they actually speak English, but they're the kids of the missionaries, and so most of them are not quite following the Lord, and we would love to have an American come and speak to these students. And so everyone's looking around, and, and, and somehow I was nominated as the guy that would go. And so I thought, okay, cool, no problem. I do this. You know, I can teach. I'll go down there and encourage them. That'll be good. I'm thinking, you know, if these are American missionaries' kids. So I'm thinking 20, maybe 30 kids, no problem. And they go, okay, that's great. Well, um, just be ready. We'll have to get you a microphone and everything because there's 500-plus students And all of a sudden, my heart just dropped. And I was like, now I've spoken to crowds that big before, but not in a foreign country, not in an element where I am, I am just, just uncomfortable. And when he said that, I remember just, just great fear rose inside of me. And, and that was just last year, All right, I've been doing ministry for five plus years now and just last year. And so I was scared, but I got to tell you, as I began to prepare and as I began to think about that, I began to pray for those students because I had less than 24 hours to get ready. As I began to prepare, I watched as the Lord used his spirit to put aside the fear, to remind me he was in control and that he could do anything through me as long as I was letting him lead the way. And sure enough, we went, we shared the gospel, we encouraged them, and it was an incredible time that I'll never forget. So don't be afraid. Remember that God is with you. His spirit is living inside of you. But if you have a spiritual gift, and you do because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, find out what that gift is and do it, and do it to the best of your ability. And I promise the body of Christ will be rewarded, and so will you.